White by Jack London. Part 5. Chapter 5. The Sleeping Wolf. It was about this time that the newspapers were full of the daring escape of a convict from San Quentin prison. He was a ferocious man. He had been ill-made in the making. He had not been born right, and he had not been helped by any of the moulding he had received at the hands of society. The hands of society are harsh, and this man was a striking sample of its handiwork. He was a beast. A human beast, it is true, but nevertheless so terrible a beast that he can best be characterised as carnivorous. In San Quentin prison, he had proved incorrigible. Punishment failed to break his spirit. He could die dumb, mad and fighting to the last, but he could not live and be beaten. The more fiercely he fought, the more harshly society handled him, and the only effect of harshness was to make him fiercer. Straitjackets, starvation and beatings and clubbings were the wrong treatment for Jim Hall. But it was the treatment he received. It was the treatment he had received from the time he was a little pulpy boy in a San Francisco slum, soft clay in the hands of society and ready to be formed into something. It was during Jim Hall's third term in prison that he encountered a guard that was almost as great a beast as he. The guard treated him unfairly, lied about him to the warden, lost his credits, persecuted him. The difference between them was that the guard carried a bunch of keys and a revolver. Jim Hall had only his naked hands and his teeth, but he sprang upon the guard one day and used his teeth on the other's throat, just like any jungle animal. After this, Jim Hall went to live in the incorrigible cell. He lived there three years. The cell was of iron, the floor, the walls, the roof. He never left this cell. He never saw the sky nor the sunshine. Day was a twilight and night was a black silence. He was in an iron tomb, buried alive. He saw no human face spoke to no human being. When his food was shoved into him, he growled like a wild animal. He hated all things. For days and nights he bellowed his rage at the universe. For weeks and months he never made a sound, in the black silence, eating his very soul. He was a man and a monstrosity, as fearful a thing of fear as ever gibbered in the visions of a maddened brain. And then, one night, he escaped. The warders said it was impossible, but nevertheless the cell was empty, and half in and half out of it lay the body of a dead guard. Two other dead guards marked his trail through the prison to the outer walls, and he had killed with his hands to avoid noise. He was armed with the weapons of the slain guards, a live arsenal that fled through the hills pursued by the organised might of society. A heavy price of gold was upon his head. Avaricious farmers hunted him with shotguns. His blood might pay off a mortgage or send a son to college. Public-spirited citizens took down their rifles and went after him. A pack of bloodhounds followed the way of his bleeding feet, and the sleuth hounds of the law, the paid fighting animals of society, with telephone and telegraph and special train, clung to his trail night and day. Sometimes they came upon him, and men faced him like heroes, or stampeded through barbed wire fences, to the delight of the Commonwealth, reading the account at the breakfast table. It was after such encounters that the dead and wounded were carted back to the towns and their places filled by men eager for the manhunt. And then Jim Hall disappeared. The bloodhounds vainly quested on the lost trail. Inoffensive ranchers in remote valleys were held up by armed men 
and compelled to identify themselves, while the remains of Jim Hall were discovered on a dozen mountainsides by greedy claimants for blood money. In the meantime, the newspapers were read at Sierra Vista, not so much with interest as with anxiety. The women were afraid. Judge Scott pooh-poohed and laughed, but not with reason, for it was in his last days on the bench that Jim Hall had stood before him and received sentence. And in open court, before all men, Jim Hall had proclaimed that the day would come when he would wreak vengeance on the judge that sentenced him. For once, Jim Hall was right. He was innocent of the crime for which he was sentenced. It was a case, in the parlance of thieves and police, of railroading. Jim Hall was being railroaded to prison for a crime he had not committed. Because of the two prior convictions against him, Judge Scott imposed upon him a sentence of 50 years. Judge Scott did not know all things, and he did not know that he was party to a police conspiracy, that the evidence was hatched and perjured, that Jim Hall was guiltless of the crime charged, and Jim Hall, on the other hand, did not know that Judge Scott was merely ignorant. Jim Hall believed that the judge knew all about it, and was hand in glove with the police in the perpetration of the monstrous injustice. So it was when the doom of fifty years of living death was uttered by Judge Scott that Jim Hall, hating all things in society that misused him, rose up and raged in the courtroom until dragged down by half a dozen of his blue-coated enemies. To him, Judge Scott was the keystone in the arch of injustice, and upon Judge Scott he emptied the vials of his wrath and hurled the threats of his revenge yet to come. Then Jim Hall went to his living death and escaped. Of all this, White Fang knew nothing, but between him and Alice, the master's wife, there existed a secret. Each night after Sierra Vista had gone to bed, she rose and let in White Fang to sleep in the big hall. Now, White Fang was not a house dog, nor was he permitted to sleep in the house. So, each morning, early, she slipped down and let him out before the family was awake. On one such night, while all the house slept, White Fang awoke and lay very quietly. And very quietly he smelled the air and read the message it bore of a strange god's presence. And to his ears came the sounds of the strange god's movements. White Fang burst into no furious outcry. It was not his way. The strange god walked softly. But more softly walked White Fang, for he had no clothes to rub against the flesh of his body. He followed silently. In the wild he had hunted live meat that was infinitely timid, and he knew the advantage of surprise. The strange god paused at the foot of the great staircase and listened, and White Fang was as dead. So without movement was he as he watched and waited. Up that staircase the way led to the Love Master, and to the Love Master's dearest possessions. White Fang bristled, but waited. The strange god's foot lifted. He was beginning the ascent. Then it was that White Fang struck. He gave no warning, with no snarl anticipating his own action. Into the air he lifted his body in the spring that landed him on the strange god's back. White Fang clung with his forepaws to the man's shoulders, at the same time burying his fangs in the back of the man's neck. He hung on for a moment, long enough to drag the god over backward. Together they crashed to the floor. White Fang leapt clear, and as the man struggled to rise, was in again with the slashing fangs. Sierra Vista awoke in alarm. 
The noise from downstairs was as that of a score of battling fiends. There were revolver shots. A man's voice screamed once in horror and anguish. There was a great snarling and growling, and over all arose a smashing and crashing of furniture and glass. But almost as quickly as it had arisen, the commotion died away. The struggle had not lasted more than three minutes. The frightened household clustered at the top of the stairway. From below, as from out of an abyss of blackness, came up a gurgling sound, as of air bubbling through water. Sometimes this gurgle became sibilant, almost a whistle. But this too quickly died down and ceased. Then naught came up out of the blackness, save a heavy panting of some creature struggling sorely for air. Weed and Scott pressed a button, and the staircase and downstairs hall were flooded with light. Then he and Judge Scott, revolvers in hand, cautiously descended. There was no need for this caution. White Fang had done his work. In the midst of the wreckage of overthrown and smashed furniture, partly on his side, his face hidden by an arm, lay a man. Weed and Scott bent over, removed the arm and turned the man's face upward. A gaping throat explained the manner of his death. Jim Hall, said Judge Scott, and father and son looked significantly at each other. Then they turned to White Fang. He too was lying on his side. His eyes were closed, but the lids slightly lifted in an effort to look at them as they bent over him, and the tail was perceptibly agitated in a vain effort to wag. Weedon Scott patted him, and his throat rumbled an acknowledging growl. But it was a weak growl at best, and it quickly ceased. His eyelids drooped and went shut, and his whole body seemed to relax and flatten out upon the floor. He's all in, poor devil, muttered the master. We'll see about that, asserted the judge as he started for the telephone. Frankly, he has one chance in a thousand, announced the surgeon after he had worked an hour and a half on White Fang. Dawn was breaking through the windows and dimming the electric lights. With the exception of the children, the whole family was gathered about the surgeon to hear his verdict. One broken hind leg, he went on, three broken ribs, one at least of which has pierced the lungs. He has lost nearly all the blood in his body. There is a large likelihood of internal injuries. He, he must have been jumped upon, to say nothing of three bullet holes clear through him. One chance in a thousand is really optimistic. He hasn't a chance in ten thousand. But we mustn't lose any chance that might be of help to him, Judge Scott exclaimed. Never mind the expense. Put him under the X-ray. Anything. Whedon, telegraph at once to San Francisco for Dr. Nichols. No reflection on you, Doctor. You understand, but he must have the advantage of every chance. The surgeon smiled indulgently. Of course, I understand. He deserves all that can be done for him. He must be nursed as you would nurse a human being, a sick child. And don't forget what I told you about temperature. I'll be back at ten o'clock again. White Fang received the nursing. Judge Scott's suggestion of a trained nurse was indignantly clamoured down by the girls, who themselves undertook the task. And White Fang won out on the one chance in ten thousand denied him by the surgeon. The latter was not to be censured for his misjudgment, all his life he had tended and operated on the soft humans of civilization, who lived sheltered lives, and had descended out of many sheltered generations. Compared with White Fang, they were frail and flabby, and clutched life without any strength in their grip. White Fang had come straight from the wild, where the weak perish early, and shelter is vouchsafed to none. 
in neither his father nor his mother was there any weakness, nor in the generations before them. A constitution of iron and the vitality of the wild were White Fang's inheritance, and he clung to life, the whole of him, and every part of him, in spirit and in flesh, with the tenacity that of old belonged to all creatures. Bound down a prisoner, denied even movement by the plaster casts and bandages, White Fang lingered out the weeks. He slept long hours and dreamed much, and through his mind passed an unending pageant of Northland visions. All the ghosts of the past arose and were with him. Once again he lived in the lair with Kitch, crept trembling to the knees of Grey Beaver to tender his allegiance, ran for his life before Lip Lip and all the howling bedlam of the puppy pack. He ran again through the silence, hunting his living food through the months of famine, and again he ran at the head of the team, the gut whips of Mitsar and Grey Beaver snapping behind, their voices crying, Rah! Rah! When they came to a narrow passage, and the team closed together like a fan to go through. He lived again all his days with Beauty Smith and the fights he had fought. At such times he whimpered and snarled in his sleep, and they that looked on said his dreams were bad. But there was one particular nightmare from which he suffered, the clanking, clanging monsters of electric cars that were to him colossal screaming lynxes. He would lie in a screen of bushes, watching for a squirrel to venture far enough out on the ground from its tree refuge. Then, when he sprang out upon it, it would transform itself into an electric car, menacing and terrible, towering over him like a mountain, screaming and clanging and spitting fire at him. It was the same when he challenged the hawk down out of the sky. Down out of the blue it would rush as it dropped upon him, changing itself into the ubiquitous electric car. Or again, he would be in the pen of Beauty Smith, Outside the pen men would be gathering. He knew that a fight was on, and he watched the door for his antagonist to enter. The door would open, and thrust in upon him would come the awful electric car. A thousand times this occurred, and each time the terror it inspired was as vivid and great as ever. Then came the day when the last bandage and the last plaster cast were taken off. It was a gala day. All Sierra Vista gathered round. The master rubbed his ears, and he crooned his love growl. The master's wife called him the Blessed Wolf, which name was taken up with the acclaim, and all the women called him the Blessed Wolf. He tried to rise to his feet, and after several attempts fell down from weakness. He had lain so long that his muscles had lost their cunning, and all the strength was gone out of them. He felt a little shame because of this weakness, as though, forsooth, he were failing the gods in the service he owed them. Because of this, he made heroic efforts to arise, and at last he stood on his four legs, tottering and swaying back and forth. The blessed wolf, chorused the women, Judge Scott surveyed them triumphantly. Out of your own mouths be it, he said. Just as I contended right along, no mere dog could have done what he did. He's a wolf. A blessed wolf, amended the judge's wife. Yes, blessed wolf, agreed the judge. And henceforth, that shall be my name for him. He'll have to learn to walk again, said the surgeon. So we might as well start right now. Won't hurt him. Take him outside. And outside he went, like a king, with all Sierra Vista about him and tending on him. He was very weak, and when he reached the lawn he lay down and rested for a while. Then the procession started on, little spurts of strength coming into White Fang's muscles as he used them, and the blood began to surge through them. 
The stables were reached, and there in the doorway lay Collie, a half dozen pudgy puppies playing about her in the sun. White Fang looked on with a wondering eye. Collie snarled warningly at him, and he was careful to keep his distance. The master, with his toe, helped one of the sprawling puppy towards him. He bristled suspiciously, but the master warned him that all was well. Collie, clasped in the arms of one of the women, watched him jealously, and with a snarl warned him that all was not well. The puppy sprawled in front of him. He cocked his ears and watched it curiously. Then their noses touched, and he felt the warm little tongue of the puppy on his jowl. White Fang's tongue went out, he knew not why, and he licked the puppy's face. Hand-clapping and pleased cries from the gods greeted the performance. He was surprised, and he looked at them in a puzzled way. Then his weakness asserted itself, and he lay down, his ears cocked, his head on one side, as he watched the puppy. The other puppies came sprawling toward him, to Collie's great disgust, and he gravely permitted them to clamber up and tumble over him. At first, amid the applause of the gods, he betrayed a trifle of his old self-consciousness and awkwardness. This passed away as the puppy's antics and mauling continued, and he lay with half-shut, patient eyes, drowsing in the sun. <laughs>